Hello everyone and welcome to the Arts Council of Lady Smith and District. Um, we're just getting set up here to do a guest speaker talk uh, as part of our online exhibition, Mono Prints. Uh, so joining me in just a couple of seconds is going to be our guest speaker and we're really excited to have Dominic Modlinski from Nanaimo, BC. Maybe tell us a little bit about uh, your artwork and the, and the style that you paint in. Well, um, the landscape painting was always uh, something that I was always interested in since very early age because the, uh, I had, I guess since a young, young child, I always had this environmental consciousness. You know, I was always fascinated by critters, by plants, by trees ecosystems. I spent a lot of time in the mountains with my father as a young boy. So uh, in the second year of OCA, I developed a passion for landscape paintings through one of our um, uh, field trips, one week field trip to Algoma region in Northern Ontario, where the group of seven painted, and uh, fall in love with the Northern landscape. Um, which I thought was Northern landscape then. And uh, basically uh, within a few days, it became a, a focus of my, uh, of my career. Uh, even so I was still a student. My, my passion became a landscape painting, uh, painting planner and then developing the, the planner sketches and photographs into large studio paintings. So you didn't start off with the la with landscape painting. You started off in is it printmaking first? Yeah, when I was uh, age six, I started to study with a master print the printmaker in Poland, uh, in a in a place called Palace of uh, of Culture, uh, which people who are from Poland will exactly know what I mean. And it was a great program uh, for young children and young adults. And I studied anything from, I started with uh, monoprints, uh, lino cuts, and then moved uh, uh, slowly into the wood cuts uh, and um, uh, etchings. And then later on when I was in OCA, I fell in love with the big sandstones, I forgot. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so got printed, uh, studied that for a, for a, for a week, uh, for a whole year. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, the, pa the painting, the sense of color that would really excited me, but it also the texture of building up the texture with colors. That's what kind of, uh, pushed me forward towards, uh, oil painting oil painting right so what do you like about the sort of the landscape style of artwork is there something that really draws you to that sort of that sort of subject matter yeah uh, I mean obviously nature is uh, something that we see on everyday basis constantly surrounding us um, so nature is never still it constantly changes uh, there is a constant sense of death and uh, birth, a constant cycle of rebirth happening. That's something that I always was interested in. And also the micro and microcosm of nature, the, cons the contrast between the uh, very small and very big. Uh, so also juxtaposition and also social juxtaposition, you know, the destructions of nature and the nature that evolves without humans and flourishes. So, um, I also interested in a very physical travel um, and a uh, sense of exploration by, you know, means of hiking, uh, kayaking, backpacking. And uh, I always, and sometimes of course, motorcycle travel. And uh, I always carry my um, planner kit and I try to paint on location as much as I can. And those sketches, those ideas, those inspirations, 
a later um, projected into large studio paintings, like you see one before uh, be behind me, and that's of Clackwood Sound. Um, I, on average, I paint between two to three paintings a day uh, if I'm plein air painting, and I always make a point of finishing a painting from from beginning to end. And that's a finished painting, which is 11 by 14, and but those are called plein air paintings. Uh, I never touched them again in the studio since I don't believe in manipulating them anymore. Um, those are impressions of me being outside, me being influenced by outside forces, by, uh, by the weather, by the smell, uh, by the color changes. Uh, patterns of uh, shadow and light and clouds and basically a uh, planner sketch for me is like a little uh, a notebook uh, notation uh, of color and shapes and sometimes color harmonies so that's aside but at the same time as I am painting in one location which is usually pre pretty uh, uh, amazing and attractive in terms of compositions and views, I take a constant, constant photographs. Just in case I will have opportunity of combining some ideas from the sketch with the photograph uh, for a large studio painting like that. So the ideas of both photography and planner sketches come into play of painting and composing a big painting like that. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about the painting that you have in the background there? So this, uh, this particular painting is from Vargas Island, which is in a Clackwood uh, Sound archipelago. And I went there uh, with two other uh, painter friends a couple of years ago. And uh, we just focused on uh, hiking and taking uh, photography um, shots as much as I could. So on that particular trip, I didn't paint. I, photo I focus on photography, which is as important also as uh, actual painting. If you become proficient in plein air painting, then photography becomes a valuable tool. Uh, but you do have to know how to uh, you know, go beyond the photograph and how to uh, make the composition that you see in a photograph speak to the viewer as a painting, uh, uh, not uh, as a you know, direct copy of photographs. So obviously we have to say it about open shadows, closed shadows and the differences, obviously how the camera eye, the sensor of the camera sees vice versa our uh, human eye. Right. Okay. So there is a process behind, you know, taking the photographs, but then also using those as kind of a reference. That's right. Okay. Very much. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I uh, over the years I became, you know, relatively pretty good photographer. Uh, you know, learning from other people, but also you know, spending some time with uh, professional photographers in the field, and uh, through you know trial and error too. And of course, learning when is the best light uh, to photograph, uh, when is the worst light to photograph, sometimes when is the time not to photograph, just relax and enjoy the landscape, and when is the, the most valuable time to photograph, and then you try to shoot, shoot, shoot as many photographs as possible, because you never know what you might bring home later on. Right. So with the photographs that you take, when you, st when, when you use those kind of as a bit of a reference for your paintings, do you also put like your own interpretation of kind of how you saw things in your head uh, onto the painting? Or My biggest uh, change to any type of uh, photography material that I use is obviously my uh, use of color and the color harmonies that, you, that, that I use. You know, the, the shapes, I'm, I probably keep it relatively close to the photograph that I, uh, that I uh, am focusing on, but uh, the color interpretation and the surface interpretation, that all comes from um, painting on plein air, uh, because I know how, how I'm going to treat, you know, given 
given type of uh, species of a tree. I know how I'm going to paint that because I've done it so many times outside, you know. I know if I, I know how to paint a black spruce because I know I painted hundreds of black spruce outside. So it comes relatively easy for me to do that and change uh, that when I'm painting a studio painting and also when I'm painting a West Coast, you know, uh, the shapes of the Western Red Sea, the Sitka, Hemlock, you know, they have a very distinct shapes and silhouettes and colors uh, that all those things are locked in my memory and I just kind of access them as a library. Okay. So uh, going back to the painting behind you, how do you kind of, what's your process in kind of getting from point A to point B with this sort of painting? Where do you start? I'm with a type of a painter that I, for me, it doesn't matter where I can start. I can start in the middle and start expanding. I, uh, Obviously, if you if you're working on a smaller a smaller painting, then I uh, I sometimes try to block uh, many uh, uh, most of its shapes right away. Uh, but on a big painting like that, there is for me there's no no point. So in this particular painting, I start usually from working from top to down because there are constant overlaps of shapes, right? And uh, uh, some some edges I like to keep keep it uh, nice and crisp, uh, so that's why uh, you know I, I would paint the sky, the middle ground, and the, the another middle ground, and the, the foreground, and then of course on top of it, then comes mm, different shapes. Like here, I will have you know that uh, darkish foreground up there. I will have um, logs and they will be painted later on. So the foreground will start to make more sense when you're gonna have that driftwood laying on top of it. Okay. So you also travel quite a bit um, to go to different locations and find subject matter that speaks to you. Um, how do you go about choosing the places that you wanna visit that will obviously become part of your painting? Well, there are some areas that I always been interested of traveling to since childhood and some of them I realized, some of them I did not realize and they just come from maybe my internal dreams of, um, of the part of the world that I heard of, I learned of, that I uh, feel like I would like to visit. I also, what I did also, I brought uh, some planner sketches, which are frames. So I'm gonna show you, show you, for example. So this, uh, this is a painting uh, from Antarctica, uh, Antarctic Peninsula. I was on a Russian uh, icebreaker as an artist in residence. So that painting is 11 by 14 and brought all the way from Antarctica back in my backpack, back to Canada. Here is another painting of Torres del Peña National Park in, uh, in uh, Chile and Argentina that I visited. Uh, that's Patagonia. And that was one of the, my most uh, desirable lists, my bucket list since I was age seven. I saw those mountains in a geography class, uh, I think uh, in grade, grade four or something, and I said, one day I'm gonna stand under those mountains, and I did. I was uh, I was 37 when I painted this. There is a, so I brought a few examples of of sketches, which were done in different locations. This one is a, uh, one of the um, oldest uh, Mayan structures in Bolivia on Isle del Sol, which is believed to be a, 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 a birth of place for the indigenous people in Bolivia. And once again, this particular painting uh, was brought back on the back of the motorcycle. We did a 10,000 kilometer trip, painting trips through the Bolivian wilderness, Andes and Amazon, uh, riding two off-road bikes and painting and filming. So that's uh, South America. And here is obviously my, one of my favorite locations to paint, the, the mighty Yukon, which I spent 
uh, nearly 25 years painting. And that's in locations, Mackenzie Mountains. And here we get a little bit closer to home with some cultural significance. That's, uh, that's a longhouse in Alert Bay. And uh, yeah, with the West Coast Totem Pole, as you can see, also very different uh, uh, color harmonies than the rest. And one, one last one to give your audience a different taste. And uh, here is uh, a view from more of a BC interior that's in um, Twidsmoor Provincial Park, down between William Lakes. Lake and Bella Coola. And from each of those trips, I still have hundreds of paintings to paint. Are you trying to bring environmental awareness or any sort of awareness to people who, you know, don't know that these places exist, don't know that these places, these ecosystems may be in danger um, of being destroyed? You know, I started painting Canada first, obviously, as my uh, landscape subject matter. But as I traveled more outside our borders, you know, of course, I realized there are similarities uh, between, uh, uh, between the landscape and, you know, significant uh, differences too. Uh, but what I want to bring, bring an awareness through my painting is that we live on this one, only one planet, which is wonderful, which is beautiful, uh, which is so diverse, but also we are all um, bonded by the same needs, fresh air, clean water. Those are two things, uh, besides food too, uh, that we need to, uh, to survive. And regardless if it's a desert or an Arctic environment, you still gonna deal with those components. So I would like my audiences, my uh, people who you know, collect my work to, to think that we don't live in a separate enclaves. We, we live in one world, which is, which, is, uh, which is wonderful, which is diverse by its one. Okay, yeah. So out of all your travels, where's, what, what's been the, what's, where's been the most challenging to, to get to and to, kind of, um, and to kind of paint and sketch from there? I think, uh, I think the most memorable and challenging travel was when, uh, I decided to film our first TV, uh, first season of our TV series of Changing Landscapes, and we decided to go to Bolivia. And we went for seven weeks, and we traveled for seven weeks uh, uh, on motorcycles, carrying all our gear, and painting right on locations, and uh, uh, you know, traversing the most craziest rivers. Uh, driving the probably the most dangerous roads uh, in the whole world, uh, getting lost in the highest one of the highest cities in the world, La Paz, um, eating poorly, but uh, it was a an adventure that I would never uh, regret or I never forget for my the rest of my life. Um, and definitely, you know, uh, and. One time, remember, uh, we, we, we planned this whole trip using the existing uh, maps and stuff. And uh, we got to this one town and we're just about to cross and join one of the main roads uh, going in towards the Amazon uh, forest. It turned out that the, the, the town we got to, there was no road joining the highway. Uh, so we asked, asked the locals, uh, they said, oh yeah, it's a projection. Uh, <laughs> so there is no road. There is, was a little trail and there was no chance of taking our bikes in. So to get into the Amazon, we had to, we had to take a, a, a route through the, uh, through the mountains, through the Amazonian, Mount, uh, Amazonian Andes. It was on, on the eastern side, so it was uh, quite lush and, and warm. And we had to travel 400 kilometer detours through the, through the dirt truck to get to and be able to pop up and travel, uh, travel more east towards Brazil. 
and yeah, that was a, that was a detour, but that was a part of adventure. And then, of course, you know, once we got towards the end of the trip, we were in the salt flats and were planning to ride right across the salt flats, hundred kilometers across the the, the sea uh, sea desert, uh, salt desert. And that's when my motorcycle died. <laughs> and that was another adventure. So yeah, and everything you know, each day evolved around painting and filming. Right. Right. So, um, is there a place that you haven't gone yet that you'd really like to go? Yes. Mongolia. Okay. Why Mongolia? Uh, again, Mongolia, just like Patagonia, was a childhood dream of mine. Um, I guess it's because I grew up with lots of stories of Mongolia, uh, because my grand grandfather, um, uh, fought in a, uh, fought in a uh, uh, Russian Tsarist uh, army during the Japanese Russian War as, a, as an officer, and he was stationed in Mongolia. So my father's house was full of uh, pictures uh, from that my grand grandfather took of Mongolian uh, culture, and. Uh, and also, I read a lot about Mongolia. I was always fascinated by the nomadic um, culture of, of Mongolian people and the vast landscapes. Yeah. Right. And is, is the reason why you travel to these places is that there's also that cultural element of things that you really enjoy at the same time? Yes, of course. When I was younger, that wasn't really as... Uh, Important to me, uh, but right now I definitely uh, find the link between the the, the rich cultural uh, tradition. Let's say, for example, if we go to Central America, and especially in uh, Southern America, like you know Peru, Bolivia, Chile, where you start finding uh, you know. Uh, civilizations that existed for way longer than our Western civilization, you feel humble, but also it becomes extremely, you know, uh, attractive uh, because there is a constant sense of exploration. Um, and the people of those times definitely lived with some kind of accordance with the laws of nature. So, uh, yeah, and then definitely uh, I traveled to Japan. I studied in Japan too, and um, uh, Japanese culture always, um, a sense of aesthetics of Japanese culture always uh, fascinated, fascinated me um, deeply. Um, are you working on anything right now? So this is a painting. Uh, I just completed 3648 uh, of, um, Yukon, and that was done from a trip I did in the fall. This is from the top of the world highway going from Dawson City towards Alaska. And there is lots of fresh uh, forest fires. So I'm, that's one of the subjects methods that I have explored for years. So that constant sense of uh, death and rebirth. Uh, this is a seven foot painting. It's called Avatar Blue. And it's uh, just around the block, well, around the block, uh, just in one of the trails that I hike with my dogs. Uh, so the beautiful contrast between dark and light, cool and warm, a fall scene. This is also uh, a seven foot painting, so quite large. It takes a lot of, lot of energy to paint something like that. Uh, this is uh, of Bella Kula. So I, I finished the top and then the bottom, and now I'm gonna be moving into middle ground. And this is uh, representing a close view of macro, micro and macro relationship of the mountain. And this is gonna be during the sunset. So there's gonna be lots of blues and oranges on those rocks. So that is currently what I've been working and working on in my studio. The size, I mean, is that something you've always wanted to paint large, large scale? Is there a reason why that, that you choose to do that big? I don't, I don't like painting uh, small scale, except obviously 
on in a plein air because it's a, a small scale is easy to capture and if you're using with the using big brush on let's say 11 by 14 you can get that very gestural type mark if you go slightly bigger then it gets a little bit more difficult so but in a in a studio paintings i like to take my time and work out my ideas all of all the uh, type of ideas and dreams that i had while, I'm, while i was painting outside and transform that language into uh, into studio paintings so a group of seven always uh, had and they always talked about the challenge um, of transferring those beautiful uh, you know very expressive sketches uh, into a studio paintings so and keeping that momentum Tom Thompson especially you can see in his paintings sometimes it was a hit and miss He's obviously paintings, small eight by 10 sketches were all jeweled. But if you were, were look at his um, studio paintings, because obviously he died so young, unfortunately, he still didn't have a chance to develop the, um, the skill and the language of transforming to a larger, larger skill like some other, other uh, more senior um, group of seven. So the challenge of transferring the language from small to big is always on my mind. So the size, obviously, I want to paint the size that represents the grandeur of the of the of the landscape I'm painting. But also, <laughs> that might be interested for artists, landscape artists who might be watching this uh, this program is the unfortunately small paintings in today's uh, time, in today's economy, do not sell anymore. Before 2008, I basically lived of my 11 by 14 uh, and then painted my studio paintings uh, and I just kept them for exhibitions. So I had this really great equation, paint small, live of them, paint big ones and sell, sell them out pretty much all at once during the exhibition. Right now, small paintings can vary, close to impossible to sell. Uh, but big paintings, the bigger, the easier it is to sell. Okay, that I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known about that because I would almost think that you'd have to find the space to hang something so large. It's not an issue. <laughs> <laughs> You wouldn't believe the people that people uh, have space and they have money, you know, and especially during the cri economic crisis, the people who who have money, but like serious money, they make even more money and they like to invest in not in the stock market because obviously that's a kind of a losing game uh, currently, but in art, serious art. So, and you saw that we've seen that pattern happening since the Great Depression. Is this something that you do as a, as a living, right? Yes, I've been doing a full-time painting, except for two months of working on a construction <laughs> once since 1993. If people are looking at kind of going into this as being something that's full-time, do you have any suggestions or just like in any arts music martial arts uh, writing you have to do it nearly every day to become proficient and constantly excel in your craft and you you should never be satisfied with it you should be your worst critic the second thing is if you think you're just gonna paint and you know and you're going to try selling paintings and everything's going to be fine. That's a total illusion and a dr pipe dream. It, the sacrifices that uh, 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 serious full-time artists do for their careers are unbelievable. They pretty much come down to sacrificing your own family, your children, your wife, your dog. Uh, and uh, you have to be extremely, I have to say, uh, you know, as I see it, extremely self-centered to paint and to become really good. Although there is a balance to it. Once you become that good and you start selling, then you can back off from that. It has nothing to do about the ego. 
but you can back off a little bit and then start having time for other things, obviously. And uh, right now, as for me, during my 20s and 30s, I did nothing but pain. I, I sacrificed everything for painting. Right now, I don't have to do that. Uh, my career is established. I'm able to commit a lot of time to my family, to other activities, to other hobbies that I enjoy to do it because, you know, I don't have to basically prove anything to myself or to others anymore. If somebody's looking at getting started, you know, painting a landscape, what, what can they kind of start with? Like, is there any tools, anything that they should look at when, they, when they're sitting down with their sketchbook and their pen and paper? Is there anything that they might want to maybe start to look at uh, that could help them maybe kind of explore um, landscape painting? Yeah, definitely don't take uh, big challenges. Uh, don't think you're gonna be able to cap capture, you know, multiple um, subject matters like, you know, mountains, middle ground, ocean, waves and rocks all at once and be successful at it. No, what I did and lots of, of my friends that I grew up in, uh, you know, uh, painting landscape, what we did, we, we each season or each month, we focus on one area. So for example, uh, when I was still in the last year of college, I decided I really need to know how to paint snow. So I spent uh, two weeks living in a, uh, outside uh, and, and painting snow in Northern Ontario. And by the end of it, I, had, I came back with 50 sketches. Some of them were really bad, but there were about, you know, about one quarter of them were really good. And I was able to capture the nuances of light and snow. So later on, when I started painting snow, it was much easier. The same thing goes with the clouds, the painting forest interior, you know, don't, don't focus uh, about the background focus about the you know the play of mm, positive and negative shapes in the forest interior you know rocks you know change of planes change of light uh, you know how the rock feels is it smooth is it sharp so once you start learning how to paint individual elements then you have tools you have multiple tools and then you start bringing all those tools together and then you're gonna have a a multi-layer painting. So don't put too much expectations on, on yourself because then it's gonna be frustrating and painful. Painful. Just paint something one or draw something one at a time and then add another component to it. I just wanna quickly touch base. You also have, um, you do a, a TV series, is that correct as well too? Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, a few years ago, well, for a long time, I had a dream to create some kind of a, a TV program about painting in the wilderness. So my friend, my very good friend, since I know him since the Northern BC days, Scott Wilson, he currently uh, uh, is from Gabriola. Uh, he's also a filmmaker and a jack of all trades and a very interesting man. Uh, we decide we're gonna team up together and um, film. So he's interested in a social aspect, cultural aspect. I'm more interested in nature. So the whole concept of it was combining those elements all together and each episode de dealt with a different location. And during the location, there was a quest for me to find this ultimate location to paint during the day. And then as we coming down towards the end of uh, the episode, uh, we are uh, also embracing the, the human and social aspect of the landscape that we are traveling with. So it could be environmental destruct destruction, could be uh, amazing uh, uh, Mayan festival, uh, could be um, uh, uh, road breaking, uh, uh, break up on the side of the road, wild animals, uh, photo shoot. So the first series we created was on in, uh, Bolivia, uh, into Bolivia. Uh, the, our series called Changing Landscapes, so constantly changing. 
And that was eight part episode, which was shown on a show television. And now you can view it on our Changing Landscape TV website for free. And the other uh, season, second season, we created on our own backyard here on uh, Vancouver Island. And we traveled to many locations from the north all the way down south to uh, Victoria. I was down on the same premise, but we obviously uh, dived in into the local history of Vancouver Island and what's happening both environmentally and looking some is for, is, uh, historical aspects and also maritime history uh, of of our of our coast. So that was and that was uh, twelve episodes, and that's also available on our website. And hopefully, time permitting and funds permitting, we'll make uh, some some more uh, uh, more episodes of different locations. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah. I think that's really great. It sounds like there's all these different avenues that you're kind of going down and it's all about exploring again, these cultures, these places that uh, most people may or may not, you know, choose to visit. So I think that's great. And yeah, it was, uh, you know, because of that whole COVID-19, uh, it was, uh, we all made plans as people. We all made plans as artists and travelers. And my Scott, uh, my friend Scott embarked on a huge trip uh, to South America in February, he left in the beginning of February, he was planning to go to Ushuaia and then all the way back on other coast. Now I was planning to meet him in Ecuador in Peru and to shoot something more because he was obviously there with the car and all the equipment. Well, when he got to Guatemala, the borders were already closed and he had to put it all the way back to Canada as fast he, as he could. Uh, so nothing came with the trip. So, you know, just have to go with the flow. Do you have a favorite place that you've been? Yeah, you, <laughs> my friend's going to laugh when I'm going to say that because it's my common answer. Yes, it's a canal road. It's, uh, it's in uh, no, uh, central eastern Yukon. It's, uh, uh, it's in, within the Mackenzie Mountains on the border, on the edge of Nahami Park. And so uh, it's a road that was created in 1942 for old, for a pipeline that was supposed to bring oil from Norman Wells to Whitehorse for the war efforts. It, did, it lasted only two years. And right now it's just kind of a road to nowhere. So uh, it's quite rough road with uh, very challenging segments for off-roading, but most incredible and diverse um, Yukon landscape. Uh, you can have and especially during the autumn is unbelievable so i say i think half of my yukon paintings are from the camera road well thank you so much for talking me talking to me today dominic and i really appreciate it is there anything else you might want to add to this conversation about um your experiences with travel um your techniques uh kind of uh, where people might want to 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 go if they wanted to you know learn a bit more about landscape painting or about you in terms of um advice to people never never afraid to take a risk because it doesn't matter uh, what kind of um uh, um experiences you will encounter you it's always going to be an adventure so that's my advice and in terms of uh, me if you want to learn more about my process I teach a lot of workshops, of course, unfortunately, because of the COVID, just like any other artist, uh, I, had to, I had to cancel all my workshops for the, <clears throat> for the spring and um, summer, but hopefully we'll be in a better position. And I'll, so I will be teaching my regular workshops out of this studio and uh, it's been quite successful i usually have six people so it's a very intimate experience so if you wish to participate uh, just look at my website for the autumn and uh, i will have my regular schedule by then hopefully